Hello, 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 and welcome back to the podcast. Thrilled that you are joining us today. And today we are actually going to be talking about a new topic, one that we haven't discussed on the podcast before, but one that is a concern for many parents. We're going to be talking about ticks and Tourette syndrome. And my guest today is an expert in that area. She is Dr. Kim Edwards, and I've had the pleasure of working with her at MindFit in Ontario, Canada. She's a registered clinical and health psychologist in the province of Ontario and the state of New York. She specializes in the assessment and treatment of repetitive behavior disorders like Tourette syndrome and trichotillomania. She also specializes in neuropsychiatric disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder and other neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD. She's actually one of only three Canadian psychologists who can certify other healthcare professionals in comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics. I'm absolutely thrilled that she is joining me here today. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Dr. Edwards, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled because we have a lot of questions that come up um, with kids who think and learn differently. And a big one um, is ticks. And that's why I was eager to talk to you and have this conversation because I know that this is your area of expertise. And, you know, we're talking about ticks, we're talking about Tourette's because there just seems to be so much confusion about what they are and how to address them. So I'd love to start with just at the beginning with what exactly are tics? And, you know, can kids or individuals control them? Let's start there. Absolutely. And I would highlight, we're talking tics, T-I-C-S. Sometimes people can use that with the T-I-C-K-S. Yes. You know, those are a different type of tics than what (laughs) we're discussing today. So the T-I-C-S, the tics, they're sudden, uh, rapid, repetitive movements and sounds that people do over and over again. And they can be classified into motor or vocal tics. So common motor tics include things like shoulder shrugging, facial grimacing, uh, arm or leg movements, things like that, eyebrow raise. More classic vocal tics could include things like coughing or throat clearing or repeating or making certain noises or sounds. And I would say that tics are actually very common. So in young kids, up to 20% of them will have a tick at some point in time. So there's a lot of physicians and societies out there that say that tics are just a normal developmental variant of childhood. And if you see them, there aren't they aren't usually cause for concern unless they're getting in the way of one's life or they last for you know, an extended period of time. But you go hang out in any kindergarten classroom and you're going to see lots of kids doing various habits and movements and vocalizations. Right. And so they're pretty common. I mean, 20%, that's a big number. Absolutely. In terms of, you know, how common and how prevalent they would be. Absolutely. If a parent has a child with tics and you've described them beautifully in terms of, you know, how they present, what they look like, this repetitive nature of these vocalizations or these motor movements. How do you then explain tics to your child or to family members that might say, why is Johnny doing that? Why is he doing it over and over and over again? Totally. Yeah. So maybe before I get into some ways to explain it, I think it's important to understand that in most cases, at least over the age of 10, Ticks are preceded by something called a premonitory urge. So this is an uncomfortable itch or sensation that you feel prior to doing your tick. Then you do your tick and you get that immediate sense of relief. That's often temporary. 
So once you can understand that, one of my favorite analogies to explain ticks is the mosquito bite analogy. Imagine I'm sitting here right now, I'm trying to focus and chat with you, but I've got a really itchy mosquito bite on my leg. This is actually true because I've spent the last few days at the cottage and I do have (laughs) a number of mosquito bites. So anyway, I'm sitting here trying to chat with you and I feel itchy and that itch is building up and I'm trying to focus on talking to you, but I'm uncomfortable. And eventually I just pause. I scratch that mosquito bite. Ah, I feel better for a second or two. And then it gets itchy again. That's very much the experience of individuals with ticks. You feel that uncomfortable sensation. You do your tick, aka scratch the mosquito bite, and it feels better. There's lots of other great analogies. Some people say that trying to suppress a tick is like holding your breath underwater or withholding a sneeze or yawn. So really hard and uncomfortable um, to do this. And when I was at a recent conference, they asked everyone in the room to open their eyes as wide as possible for 10 seconds without blinking. If you try and do that right now, just open your eyes as wide as possible and notice what sensations come to mind as you can't blink. You know, when we went around the room and um, the facilitators asked us to describe how we felt, people were saying things like uncomfortable, itchy, um, wanting to blink, having a strong urge. These are all the same kinds of terms that people with tics will use to describe that urge that happens beforehand. Right. And I love that analogy because it's something that everyone can relate to and understand. Again, having that sensation and needing to do something about the sensation and then the relief that follows. And it sounds like something to keep in mind is that these ticks are involuntary, right? The truly involuntary part of ticks is that premonitory urge. There's a varying degree of like suppressibility of ticks depending on the individual and a number of different factors. But yes, I think that's really important. This is not something purposeful. This is not something that children and adults want to be doing. This is not something that if I just tell you, please stop doing this, you can stop in the same way that it's hard to suppress yawns and sneezes and things like that. So I think that builds a lot of compassion when we can understand that this is not a choice. And if anything, most of the youth that I'm working with, in fact, all of them don't want to be doing these behaviors. And and that's important to share with family members, because again, a lot of parents will say, you know, grandma doesn't understand why he's doing that. The babysitter doesn't understand and gets annoyed and, and tells him to stop or tells her to stop. Yeah, And that can really impact a child in terms of their self-concept and particularly realizing that there's this involuntary nature, you know, that precedes the actual tick. I would say it can not only impact their self-confidence, but it could also impact tick expression. You know, we always say that ticks love attention. So even well-intentioned attention, getting you a cup of water when you have a lot of throat clearing ticks, that can actually make that tick worse or more frequent. And so a lot of the work I'm doing with parents and families is around helping them see different associations in the environment and making sure that we're supporting that youth, but not giving direct attention to the tick. You know, recently I coached a mom who was giving her son a massage every time he had a really painful um, neck jerking tick. Yes, totally give him a massage, but do it at eight o'clock at night as part of the bedtime routine. Don't do it in direct response to the tick. Because that becomes like a reward, right? Yeah. Well, there's a there can even be an unconscious connection that's established between the tick and getting that attention. You're exactly right. And so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Similarly, telling a child, Johnny, stop it. Stop it. It's really mm-hmm. loud. We're sitting in church. Please be quiet. All of those kinds of things can make the tick even worse too. Then Johnny's sitting in the car on the way to church next week thinking, don't tick, don't tick, don't tick, don't tick. And what happens? he's more likely to tick. And that adds further anxiety and stress and pressure on a little person who's already kind of struggling um, with these symptoms to begin with. Absolutely. And the example you just described, it really seems like anxiety can play a role and maybe even exacerbate the ticks. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that anxiety doesn't cause ticks. That's really an important distinction, right? These are brain based in the same way that, you know, one's diet doesn't cause diabetes, but diabetes can be influenced by environmental factors like what you eat and your exercise. The same is true for ticks. Ticks can be exacerbated um, or impacted by environmental factors such as anxiety, stress, fatigue, caffeine, all of those kinds of things. And so unsurprisingly, 
during COVID, a lot of people reported that their ticks got worse because there's been a lot of stress and social isolation. Right. Another question parents often have when they realize that their child has ticks is, will the ticks last forever? So that's a good question. So as we already mentioned, about 20% of youth are going to have a tick at some point in time, generally a couple of weeks, maybe a few months, goes away on its own. And there's no reason to suspect that those kids or um, teens will continue kind of long term. If you have a more chronic tick presentation, which is generally when ticks last for at least one year. So for example, in Tourette's syndrome, um, that's um, classified as having at least two motor and one vocal tick that's been present relatively continuously for at least one year. So if you have Tourette's syndrome or a more chronic tick disorder, so just kind of more persistent motor or vocal ticks, those kids, it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen long term. What we do know in terms of the typical course in chronic ticks, they tend to start between the ages of four to six. They tend to be at their worst between the ages of 10 to 12. And in the vast majority of youth, they get better in the later teen, early adulthood years. So for some, that means maybe going away. For others, that means getting significantly better. But I think that's a really important fact um, that ticks do tend to get better even without intervention um, for individuals with chronic ticks. You know, when I was doing my fellowship at the hospital for sick children, We did a study where we interviewed children with ticks and Tourette's syndrome, and we asked them what the most valuable piece of feedback and advice they ever received from a a healthcare professional about their ticks. And it was this very notion that even if I do nothing, they're likely to get better as I get older. So I think we can't underestimate the power of education for families, for children, in terms of understanding their symptoms and what's to come. Yeah. So it seems like there's this waxing and waning nature of ticks. And I've heard parents say that he used to have this motor tick and it manifested this way. And now there's a vocal tick and it sounds like this. And then now there's a different tick, you know, a few months later. That's a really good point. I'm glad you brought up this waxing and waning nature. What that means is it's not that ticks steadily increase in severity from ages six to 10, as I, you know, just described in terms of onset and worst kind of presentation, but they vary on a day-to-day basis. So a lot of times kids will say Sunday nights before going back to school, my ticks get worse. You know, as I'm coming off the summer and into the school year, maybe their ticks get worse. Uh, If the weather's kind of colder or they're tired or they're up late, then they notice their ticks get worse. So lots of variability in tick expression on a day-to-day basis and also variability in ticks. So um, in terms of new ticks coming and old ticks going and we'll probably get into the tick treatment in a little bit but generally that's about eight sessions or so and we always counsel parents and patients to say you can expect on average like 1.5 new ticks in the course of that eight week period it doesn't mean that the treatment's not working this is just part of the disorder that it ebbs and flows ticks disappear new ticks start Um, and that's yeah that's part of the, the course right and it sounds like from what you're saying and how you're describing kind of this waxing waning nature that there are, like you said, environmental factors that play a role as well. When you mentioned, you know, the night before, you know, school's going to start on a Sunday night or stressors, um, this uptick during COVID when stress levels were very high, that environment does play a role. And it sounds like that's a place where, you know, we're going to talk about treatment interventions, but a place where parents can even provide support in terms of, How can you minimize and reduce stress in the home? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or give kids tools and management strategies um, for that. Now, do ticks mean that kids will have other problems too? Because I see some comorbidity with ADHD and those kids often have a different type of response to medication when they've got ADHD with ticks. Yeah. Um, do ticks or having ticks increase the likelihood that you're going to have another co-occurring issue? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so before I answer that, I do want to say that the swearing tick is actually quite rare. Usually when people bring up our, I'm you glad know, you mentioned our that. ticks associated with yeah. other challenges, you know, unfortunately you go to Dr. Google and what you see are sometimes the worst case scenarios when you put in Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's has got a really bad rap in the media. People think of it like the swearing disorder, but actually less than 7% of youth with um, chronic ticks will have a swearing tick. So unlikely that that's going to be kind of the 
the challenge um, in youth with ticks. But you are right that in up to 90% of individuals with chronic ticks, so I want to make that distinction from the 20% of youth who kind of have a tick at one point in time versus the kids who end up having ticks for at least a year or so. So in that latter group, the, the kids who have ticks for at least a year, um, up to 90% of them will meet criteria for at least one other disorder at some point in time. And the most common, as you've alluded to, are ADHD. So up to 50% of kids with Tourette's will also meet criteria for ADHD. The other most common is obsessive compulsive disorder. And that occurs in about uh, 20 to 30% of youth with tics. Although there's lots of other challenges too, like sleep difficulties and learning challenges. You know, the summary or take home message here is that you, can, you can't become too tick focused as a clinician. If you're taking your child to the doctor, you wanna make sure that they're exploring these other areas as well, because these other areas are often more impairing than the ticks themselves and can be highly treatable too. I find that ticks often drive the family to come see me. The teachers notice something in class. The parents are very worried about, you know, this repetitive throat clearing. It's actually annoying the family while they try to watch their family movie on a Sunday night, things like that. But when I talk to them and I hear about these other comorbidities and we're able to treat those, that can drastically increase quality of life. For a young person. Right. So let's talk about treatment options because once you know the next step for parents is what do I do? You know, what are what do we do in terms of intervention and treatment? Are ticks treatable? Obviously they are because that's what you do. But what does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So step one, I would say I think it's important to know that ticks, they don't hurt the brain. They don't cause an impact in your intelligence or shorten your lifespan. It's important to keep that in mind. And because tips are not impairing to the brain and they don't shorten your lifespan and they don't impact intelligence, we actually don't need to do anything about them if they're not bothersome to the affected individual. So usually the treatment for the vast majority of cases is education. Education to the child, education to the family, uh, in lots of cases, education to the school or that hockey coach who's saying, Johnny, please stop ticking, please stop ticking, right? To understand a little bit more about what's going on, using some of the analogies I told you, really trying to take the attention off of the ticks and focus on the child's strengths, all the great things the child is doing, and if the child has any difficulties with anxiety or ADHD or one of those other areas. When ticks are bothersome to the individual who has them, then the two main treatment approaches are behavioral um, strategies and medication. And generally, we start with behavioral strategies. So that uh, the most common one is known as comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks. That's a mouthful, CBIT for short, or what we call in our clinic tick busters. And this is based on habit reversal therapy that's been around since the 70s for various repetitive behaviors um, like nail biting, skin picking, ticks, other kinds of things. And it's about helping the young person develop awareness of the behavior. So when does it happen? Where does it happen? That premonitory urge, what's happening inside of us? How do people respond? So being aware of those environmental cues and factors. And then we teach children a competing response or adults as well. So let's say I had a really annoying shoulder shrugging tick and I felt kind of that weird feeling in my shoulders, that urge, and then I would bring up my shoulders. An example competing response could be every time I have that urge, I actually pull my shoulders down and put my arms in towards the side of my body because I can't do the tick at the exact same time. So I'm essentially doing the opposite. I'm holding that for at least a minute or until that urge goes away. And over time, that actually weakens the negative reinforcement cycle that happens between the premonitory urge, the tick, and that feeling of relief. So you're kind of riding out the urge and over time that tick can actually go away or that urge can go away, which is really cool. And it takes a lot of hard work, right? You're not going to be motivated to do this unless it bothers you. So if your mom is really bothered by your shoulder shrugging tick, but you say, I don't care, it doesn't bother me. Kids don't really notice. Or if they do, like I just tell them, hey, it's a tick or my habit then you're not going to want to kind of do the opposite. It's like me asking you, when you have that itch to scratch a mosquito bite, I want you to clasp your hands. That's a hard thing to do without the motivation and distress behind it. 
There's also social support components. We build in relaxation strategies because we know that stress tends to make ticks worse. There's lots of education and advocacy that we build in um, to treatment as well. But I do want to say that CBIT is a management strategy, not a cure. I unfortunately don't have the magic wand to kind of take away all your ticks. As we've discussed, ticks tend to come and go. So even after you do kind of an eight to 10 session CBIT protocol treatment, it is quite likely that new ticks will pop up. The cool part is that the child will hopefully have strategies to manage any future bothersome ticks if they go through this treatment. Right. And I, I think what's really important that you said was just the bothersome nature to the child as opposed to yeah. an annoying grandma. That that's really when it's time to intervene is when it becomes bothersome to the child and it begins to interfere with daily functioning. Absolutely. And I, you know, I don't want to like negate the fact that ticks can be very challenging for the family. I do a lot of work with parents as well who say, my child's not bothered by their whistling tick, but how am I supposed to work from home when they're whistling in the next room? Right. And so we, we do talk about, edu- you know, educating, we all have to coexist in this house. So how does the child continue to do their tick? and make sure that the parents are able to work at the same time, right? We are trying to find strategies so that everyone can kind of cohabitate. Oh, exist, right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. The other strategy I want to mention is the medication piece. So generally, when ticks are bothersome, we start with the behavioral treatment. That's in part because, A, um, it's as effective as medication. B, it doesn't have the annoying side effects that medication often has. C, you can target a specific tick, right? So if my shoulder tick is bothersome, I can't go in with medication and target that in the way I can uh, with CBIT. And then D, you're also teaching the child strategies for short-term and long-term. So we're usually recommending starting with CBIT, but if you do go with medication, the most common are alpha-2 agonists, so things like guanfacine and um, clonidine, but I'll leave that to physicians and psychiatrists who do the prescribing there. Right. And how long does treatment typically last? Yeah. So the treatment studies generally have an eight week protocol for CBIT. So once a week for about a 50 minute session um, at MindFit, our treatment is very structured. We provide handouts. There's weekly homework. We usually work on two to three ticks kind of during that time frame. Although if a child was only distressed by one tick, then it could be a lot shorter. And then we do some booster sessions afterwards. Wonderful. And that that's manageable for families. Because I think oftentimes parents feel like, oh, I'm going to be in treatment forever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for the next year, we're going to be addressing these ticks. But it's, it's not that at all. No, it's, yeah, it's really awesome that it's a short term, structured, time limited. And people can really get better and make improvements in terms of their tick management strategies, which is really exciting to see and they can maintain that. The studies show that, you know, up to 90% of people who are successful in treatment will maintain those gains six months and beyond, you know, treatment ending, which is also really wonderful to hear. That is amazing. That's really fantastic. Now, parents have been hearing about this thing called functional tics, um, dub dub TikTok tics in the media. Can you talk about what exactly that is and are those ticks different from Tourette syndrome, which you mentioned before? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, during COVID, a lot of physicians, ERs, tick clinics have noticed an increase in terms of young people. So generally ages 12 to 25, most commonly female, presenting with sudden onset explosive ticks. So what I mean by that is that in these individuals, it's almost like overnight they develop ticks. They never had a history of ticks in many cases. And overnight, they develop these sudden ticks that are extremely distressing and impairing. They might be hitting themselves or other people. They might be swearing. They they have a hard time getting to school, things like that. In these patients, as I said, they tend to not have a history of ticks. They tend to be mainly female, whereas in Tourette's syndrome, it's actually three to four males to every one female um, who's diagnosed with Tourette's. I mentioned in Tourette's that ticks usually start between the ages of four to six. In these functional ticks, you're seeing them in these generally teenage girls. So as I mentioned, 12 to 25 years. In Tourette's syndrome, you've got this uncomfortable premonitory urge that precedes the tick. In these functional ticks, many don't have a premonitory urge, or if they do, it's got a different quality to that of what we see with Tourette's syndrome. So maybe I feel my whole body kind of shiver, and then I have this 
you know, explosive onset of functional tics. Also, many individuals with functional tics have a hard time suppressing them, whereas they tend to be a little bit more suppressible in youth with Tourette syndrome. So there's a, a lot of kind of differences that have emerged to suggest that functional tics are not the same thing as what we call more organic um, tics as we see with Tourette syndrome. And it's thought that the incredible stress from social isolation and other challenges during COVID in combination with increased screen time could have led to the development of ticks in certain individuals. You know, we saw this like pre-pandemic, but just the sheer number of people presenting to these clinics has grown a lot with COVID. And interestingly, with social media, the number of individuals on social media and TikTok with tics or tic-like behaviors, so these functional tics, have increased drastically during COVID. In some countries, some of the number one and two influencers are individuals with tics or tic-like behaviors. So we've seen a real growth in terms of these videos on social media. And as I mentioned, it's thought that in these vulnerable individuals, the suggestibility in watching those videos can lead to them developing the tics themselves. That is so interesting. And it also means that it sounds like the intervention would be very different for functional tics versus, you know, the traditional neurological tics that you've described. Absolutely. So, I mean, research is still kind of evolving in what this looks like with some people saying you could try CBIT. I have found that CBIT actually doesn't tend to work in individuals with functional tics because instead of focusing on the tics, what you want to actually do is be removing the attention away from the symptoms and getting them back to function, getting them back to school, back to their daily life. You want to be doing what we call more mind-body connection uh, treatments with youth with functional tics. So helping them recognize the emotions in their body, that their mind and their body are connected. When they feel a certain way, they have certain sensations that happen in their body. We want to be addressing stressors or any comorbid conditions. Um, I, I should mention as well that the comorbid conditions or associated conditions and functional tics are often different than what you see in Tourette syndrome. So you see a lot more depression or social anxiety with youth with functional tics. And we want to make sure that we're addressing those pieces as well. You know, I recently had a youth, she was having these functional tics and weakness and falling down and the school was giving her an elevator pass and she was trying to get a wheelchair and all of these kinds of things can actually make these functional tic-like behaviors worse. So we were doing a lot of education in a compassionate manner to try to pull back on some of those interventions and explain why these functional tics are different than the organic tics and are different than a seizure and things like that. Right. And it, it really takes a professional to be able to tease apart those nuances because the functional tics and the tics we've been talking about since we started this discussion can look similar. Absolutely. And if you don't understand, if parents particularly don't understand that there is a difference, um, they, they're not sure where to go f for help and how to understand the behaviors and support it appropriately. Absolutely. I even get referrals from TIC clinics for kids for CBIT. And then I meet that child and they're 13 years old and the TIC started overnight and there's lots of other stressors going on and it just doesn't fit that picture of Tourette syndrome. Usually I say that's good news. It's unlikely they have a chronic TIC condition and with the right supports and addressing those stressors, those TICs can get better in a very short amount of time. And it doesn't mean they're going to have them for the rest of their lives. But yes, you're absolutely right that you want to be making sure that the physician or healthcare professional does have a background in the functional tick piece as well, or is at least aware of that and able to kind of consider that as a differential diagnosis. Absolutely. Well, you know, I'm a firm believer in empowering children and adolescents. How do you foster resilience and advocacy in youth with tics or Tourette syndrome? Because I think that's just such an important piece for the understanding. Like you said, the psychoeducation is such an important piece, but then fostering that resilience and advocacy, particularly in kids who have those chronic tics. Yeah, that's a great question. So in the CBIT treatment that we do, and even if they don't participate in CBIT, I do a lot of education to young people. We'll show videos, we'll talk about tics. You know, I'm really passionate about this, not just in tics. I believe even young children with ADHD need to understand how their brain works. So many times I'll have families come see me 
you know, someone gave us the diagnosis, but she doesn't know yet. And my first step is to say, hold up. I think your child probably does realize that something's going on. Interestingly, as an aside, I gave a a school presentation before COVID um, about a child with Tourette's and we were educating the school. And I said to the class with the child's consent, how many of you guys knew that Sally had Tourette's syndrome before I gave this presentation today? None of the kids raised their hand. How many of you guys knew that there was something different about Sally? Everyone raised their hand. Other kids are perceptive. The kids themselves know that there's often something different about their brain and what's going on. So education is huge. Once we've given them education, I do a lot of different techniques, writing a letter, developing a business card. This is one that I've taken from the Break Shop, a clinic in London, Ontario that services kids with Tourette's syndrome. They actually have a templated business card where on one side it talks about the ticks. I see you've noticed me. This means I make movements and sounds. These are called ticks. I know they can be annoying and bothersome. You can't catch them like you can catch a cold. I deal with them as best I can. Please, you know, try to see those kinds of things. You can focus on my tits or you can see this other side of me. And then on the back of the um, business card, it's all of the child's strengths. I'm a guitar player. I like to play soccer. I'm funny. I'm resilient. I'm loyal. I'm spontaneous. These are actually some of the positives often associated with things like ADHD um, and Tourette's syndrome. And so I will get children to kind of personalize that cue card keep it in their knapsack. If they're comfortable, share that with substitute teachers, which is often challenging for many youth with Tourette's syndrome, share it with their hockey coaches, or don't share it with anyone. But the mere fact that they've created it, they start to develop an idea of what they could say in their mind if they did want to educate others. We talk about how to answer questions from peers about ticks and things like that. Again, so they feel empowered and that they can participate in the discussion. I've had children as young as six or seven participate for a few minutes at school meetings and share their own experience about ADHD. And it's often those few moments that are the most powerful part of a meeting for educators and for others, you know, involved in supporting that child. So please, like to all the parents out there, don't underestimate the power of involving your child in that education and advocacy, even from a young age. You know, the other piece about resilience is helping children understand that going through hard things can help build resilience. In fact, the definition of resilience is not somebody who's never dealt with a stressor. It's the ability to bounce back from tough things. So we'll often talk about how a pearl is formed. I don't know if you know how a pearl is formed, but we talk about how there's an oyster chilling at the bottom of the ocean and that oyster gets a piece of sand stuck inside of him. And he's annoyed. Why do I have the sand stuck inside of me? I want to get it out of me. I have to go to oyster school and none of my friends are dealing with the sand. And, you know, I really try hard, but I can't get this piece of sand outside of me. So I have to build up layers over that piece of sand so it doesn't rub against me as much and it doesn't bother me as much and I can learn to live my life with this piece of sand. And over time, it's that sand and those layers together that form a beautiful pearl. What does that mean? We would never choose for our children to have tics or ADHD or any other type of mental health challenge. And every youth and adult could benefit from learning coping strategies, relaxation strategies. And learning that at a young age means that they're able to face life stressors in a more resilient fashion and hopefully be nourishing and developing that beautiful pearl. I love that. Absolutely love that. And I will use that. (laughs) I can't take credit for that. That was Dr. Duncan McKinley uh, at the break shop, who's one of my former mentors. But But it is so true about the hard things. Oftentimes, that's what we have to, you know, ingrain in kids' brains that this is a part of life. And a lot of these struggles are part of who you are. And that doesn't diminish who you are. Because again, like you said, when you turn that card over, in the example you gave, there's all the strengths and all these talents and all of these things that are so wonderful about you. Absolutely. And really having an understanding about the differences in the way their brain is wired. And, you know, realizing again, that persisting through those difficulties is how you build those those muscles, right? Absolutely. And it's helping parents understand too that how do I accept a chronic tick disorder diagnosis in my child and focus on their strengths and who they are as a person and not get too stuck with the what ifs or what's to come 
you know, a lot of my practice sometimes is meeting with parents. They're so worried. Is my child going to have social um, challenges? Are they going to end up on my couch for the rest of my life? They're just so in the future and fearful of all of kind of the worst case scenarios they read about on the internet. And it's helping parents kind of be in the here and the now. And I really like an analogy that um, Emily Kingsway, she's a mother of a child with autism, and she writes uh, about what it's like to parent a child with a disability. And she says, imagine that you um, have wanted to go to Italy for your entire life, that you've dreamed of this wonderful vacation. Your friends have gone to Italy. They come back. They tell you how awesome it is. You buy the travel books, the guides, you learn the phrases. Finally, it's your turn to go to Italy. You're super psyched. You get on the airplane. And as the airplane starts its descent, the stewardess comes on board and says, welcome to Holland. And you say, Holland? I had planned to go to Italy. I was supposed to be in Italy. All my friends went to Italy. That was my destination. What on earth are we doing in Holland? And the stewardess says, I'm very sorry. There's a change in flight plan. This is where we're landing today. And so you get off the airplane and you look around and you think this isn't where I was supposed to be. And, you know, it's a little less flashy and there's a little um, less happening in Holland, but there's still some cool windmills and shoes and things that I can enjoy and flowers. And if I spend the whole time in Holland wishing I was in Italy, I would miss the beauty and the joy of Holland. And I, I really like this analogy because I think for parents, it's helping them recognize sometimes they're on a turbulent airplane, not sure where they're going to end up. Or they're heading towards Holland and they thought that they were going to be in Italy. And how do we help parents accept that and understand that and maybe grieve for the Italy that they wanted to go to, but also be able to see the strengths and the joy of what Holland, like what Holland can offer? Absolutely. Don't miss the beauty and the joy of Holland. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Dr. Edwards, this has been such an incredible conversation it's going to be incredibly helpful to so many families. Thank you so much for being here. If listeners want to get in touch with you to um, consult with you, to talk to you about their child, um, to, to have you come in and speak to educators, what is the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, so I can give you my email address and you can put it on your website. It's kim.edwards at mindfithealth.ca. Mindfit Health is all one word. Um, they can go through the website as well and contact the info or contact us. So mindfithealth.ca. And I'd be happy to connect with anyone or discuss any further questions. We also have lots of great resources on our website too. Wonderful. And I'll be sure to put links to the website and your email address in the show notes. Thank you again for this great and important conversation. Thank you for having me. And thank you for taking the time to prioritize this topic. I often say Tourette's is like the orphan's orphan of mental health. There's a lack of people who treat this area and there's a lack of people who are interested in this area. I know you want to wrap up. I'm just going to mention, you know, even a couple of months ago, I did a workshop to physicians in the Philippines because no one in the Philippines could provide this behavioral treatment for Tourette's. And they were thinking about how to send their patients, you know, halfway across the world to get these kinds of treatment strategies. So I think this is a really timely topic, important for parents to be aware of and important that we continue to educate other healthcare professionals so that patients with tics and chronic tics can get access to the most evidence-based treatments out there. So thank you for prioritizing this and taking the time. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here because again, this is our first conversation about tics. It probably will not be the last, but again, when you have 20% of kids experiencing ticks, it's important to talk about. So Absolutely. thank you again. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. If you'd like to have more information about ticks and the treatment of ticks, be sure to check out the show notes for a list of resources. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you being here and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.